Deutschland, just a guy trying to help out the monarch butterflies, and I want to thank you for showing an interest in trying to help them out as well. On June 24th, 2019, I got a lot of comments on the Raising Monarchs videos, along with many tweets sent my way. A new study on the monarch butterfly had come out that day, and from what I could tell in my neck of the internet woods, it had the world of monarch hobbyists all abuzz, and in many cases, a bit alarmed. Many articles and blog posts talking about the study were coming out that day, and the headlines for these things ranged from informative and accurate to a bit cautionary, all the way over to very alarming and in some cases inaccurate due to just the oversimplification of what the study actually had to say. Headlines tend to do that. Let's face it, in our fast-paced world, news stories are competing for your attention. And so, in some cases, headlines are worded in the most clickable way possible, and fear can be a pretty effective strategy. So, I did what's usually a pretty good choice. I went right to the source and read the actual study. And I gotta say, it's an incredibly interesting, well-done study. It's something that should be celebrated. It has really pushed into some territory of understanding the migratory cycle of the monarch butterfly a lot more than we knew before. Our knowledge as to how the migration exactly happens is limited, but this has definitely made some headway towards finding out more about it. And after reading the study, I was able to go back through those different articles, and it helped me a lot better to be able to see which articles were actually handling the information correctly and treating it fairly, and which of the articles were going a bit overboard, drawing some conclusions that really the study hadn't drawn. So, what did it have to say? What were the findings and what was the work involved that led up to those findings? Published by the Proceedings of National Academy of Sciences of the United States of America, June 24, 2019. The paper is titled, Contemporary Loss of Migration in Monarch Butterflies. Now, please let me apologize in advance for mispronouncing any names here. It was authored by Aisha Tenger Trolander, Wei Lu, Michelle Noyes, and Marcus Kronforst all out of the Department of Ecology and Evolution from the University of Chicago. Now, before we delve right in, let's be clear, what I'm about to do is a brief overview. The intriguing idea was to set out to measure how strong of a migratory behavior various experimental groups of monarch butterflies possessed. Such groups included wild-caught adult monarch butterflies, used as a control. The experimental groups involved wild-reared monarchs. That would be what you and I do. Wild found eggs that are then taken back to the home, or in their case, the lab, and reared. Of that experimental group, they actually divided it into wild monarchs that were reared outdoors and wild monarchs that were reared indoors. And then another group was commercially bred monarchs. So, not wild. These would be either monarchs that directly came from breeders or monarchs that were produced by monarchs that came directly from breeders. The way to test out their migratory behavior is a pretty cool idea. They harness the butterflies and place them in a flight simulator. This flight simulator allows them to orientate themselves into whichever direction they prefer. So they're not really able to fly, but they feel as if they are flying and are able to rotate 360 degrees. It's set up in a way also so that way any visual stimuli is blocked off from it, so it can't be distracted or attracted to a specific location. It's only able to visually detect the sky above it. And a sensor that's hooked up to the harness of the butterfly is able to detect what angle the butterfly is at, taking data quite often, and then averaging together what the direction was that the butterfly was most often trying to go. Taking those averages of the individual butterflies, they could then find an average or a mean direction for that experimental group. So in short, what this was able to do is take an entire group of monarch butterflies, let's say wild-reared monarchs that were reared indoors, and be able to average together all their directions and see did the group possess as a whole a strong or weak inclination to go in a certain direction. And in some cases, they could also statistically see that the data was showing random directions, that there wasn't a strong inclination in any direction. With a longer arrow, that would mean a stronger inclination to go in that direction. Smaller arrows mean, yes, that's the direction, but if it's a pretty short arrow, it means it was probably quite random. But in the first part of the study, they compared commercial monarchs to wild-reared monarchs. And in both the commercial monarchs, monarchs coming from commercial stock, and from the wild stock monarchs, they reared them both outdoors. Now, it is important to mention here, monarchs that were of this commercial stock were sourced from one commercial breeder. And so data collected from them can truly only be used to draw conclusions from that commercial stock. One thing they found was that the wild-reared monarchs that emerged as adults in August, they overall flew weakly south. 
and while reared monarchs that emerged in October, they flew directionally south. They had a very strong impulse on average to fly south, to be part of the migration. So again, to be clear, these are North American wild monarch eggs that were then reared outdoors. And when tested to see if they had migratory behavior, in August, just a little bit, migration hadn't fully started yet, and by the time we're at October, yep, a full-blown migratory behavior. Now, when it came, though, to the commercially bred monarch butterflies, those that came from commercial stock, those monarchs, even though reared outdoors in the same conditions, whether it was in August or in October, their flight pattern was random. They did not orientate in any specific direction as a group. All right, so what does that part of the study mean for us? Well, already, I hope that puts some of you at ease. Headlines that were making the claim that captive reared monarchs had lost the ability to migrate were not reporting this correctly. Quite often, headlines aren't making the distinction between what it means to be captive reared versus captive bred. As the study's results showed, provided they were reared outdoors and provided they were wild stock, those monarchs had the natural migratory instinct that we'd expect. More on that in a bit. Another part of the study was to compare the migratory behavior of wild reared monarchs being reared outdoors versus being reared indoors, and if that had any major difference. Just as before, when it came to these wild reared monarchs, if they emerged as adults during the summer months when migration wasn't really happening, they all flew in random directions. There was no overall orientation for the group. And that's what we'd expect. Migration hasn't started yet. But when it came to the autumn butterflies, it did indeed matter whether the wild reared ones were raised indoors or raised outdoors. In autumn, when migration is fully underway, wild reared monarchs that were reared indoors showed no overall orientation as a group. Whereas the wild reared monarchs that were reared outdoors showed southern group orientation. So what this showed is that monarchs from wild stock, when reared indoors, did not have an overall strong inclination to orient south when they should be. Whereas if they were reared outdoors, yes, they still had a strong directional impulse to go south, to become part of the migration. Now obviously this part of the study, this has some implications for you and me. People who take in wild eggs and sometimes caterpillars and rear them to adulthood for immediate release. But there's one more interesting piece before we start looking at the takeaways. With the wild reared outdoor monarch group, there were nine individual monarchs that when they were in the chrysalis stage, were actually brought indoors for the period of just three or four days. They were about to emerge, but severe weather caused the scientists involved to want to take them in to keep them safe. It wasn't originally an intended part of the experiment. But when these nine monarchs that had just been brought indoors for only three or four days, when they were tested, they did not show the same results as the rest of that wild-reared outdoor group. They did not orientate in any specific direction as a group. They seemed just about as random as the other groups that had a random orientation. So a major breakthrough in the study was actually an accidental one. We don't fully know what environmental cues tell monarchs and their physiology to switch on to being a migratory monarch, nor exactly how much of it is needed or exactly when they need it during their developmental stages. But we do know that just a few days away from the natural environment, close to the time of emerging, was enough to make those individuals not have it. All right, so with this new info presented, what are some of the takeaways? I think the first major takeaway that we should get from this is just that this study is incredibly awesome. Monarch migration is not very well understood, and this study alone has made some profound headway in understanding it better. Talking about the genetics, when it comes to wild North American migratory monarchs, they have the genetic impulse to migrate when given the right environmental cues. And it's quite possible that out there in the wild, without any human intervention, some monarchs might produce offspring that don't really have the right combination of genes to actually be involved in the migration. The thing is, though, to pass on your genes when it comes to that population, migration is pretty much required. It's only the monarchs that successfully migrate down to Mexico, overwinter there, and then mate and come back up in the spring that start the next cycle. So if you're a wild monarch that was produced that didn't have that migratory impulse, you get weeded out by nature and your genes don't pass on. But when it comes to commercial breeders, if they are using continuous stock, meaning they don't start each spring with brand new wild monarchs that are descendants from the previous season's migratory monarchs, they are unlikely to have proper genetics for migration. And so it's important to note here, it's for this reason that there are responsible commercial breeders that do begin each season reestablishing new wild stock from nature. So if someone were to be purchasing from a breeder, let's say a school teacher that wanted to show off some monarchs in the classroom, 
Prior to purchasing from that breeder, they may wish to first inquire if that breeder uses fresh wild stock to start each of their seasons. Another takeaway. Does this mean that us hobbyists who raise wild found eggs and sometimes caterpillars, that we should cease and desist? No, that's not what this study says. But you don't have to take my word for it and I wouldn't expect you to. Here's a direct quote from the study. In terms of seasonal rearing by summer hobbyists and school groups, we would argue that the practice of raising monarchs in this setting is net positive. This practice should absolutely continue, with the added caveats that the butterflies should be locally sourced and then subsequently reared outdoors. But now, a third takeaway definitely does apply to us. For us who raise wild monarchs, we need to pay attention to those two caveats. Well, as far as the first one, locally sourced eggs and caterpillars, that should be pretty easy. That's pretty much what we're doing anyway. Raising monarchs has never been anything involved with breeding of the monarchs. We are not monarch breeders. But when it comes to the second one, we have some adjustments to make. When it comes to the environmental cues that tell the monarchs, provided they have the right genetics, that it's time to migrate, we still don't know exactly what those are. Whether it's just one specific environmental cue, or probably more likely, a combination of multiple cues that let them know it's time to get going. And so, for the Raising Monarchs enthusiast, after this study, the responsible thing to do would be to raise your monarchs as outdoors as much as possible. Now, if it's the spring or summer months before migration has really started, then this really isn't that important. If it's June and you take in eggs, you can raise them indoors and that's not going to cause any problems. They start with wild genes and anything you do in your rearing process is not going to change their genetics. But for the eggs that are laid starting in late July and onward, those monarchs are having a good chance of being part of the migration. And the further you get away from late July, the more likely that is. For those monarchs, it is very important to raise them outdoors. Now, it also makes sense to bring up a question here. So, if you don't raise late season monarchs outdoors, is that going to guarantee that they won't be able to migrate? No, it's not a guarantee. There are still possibilities that we just don't know. We know from the study that the wild-reared monarchs that they reared outdoors did show immediate migratory behavior. And we also know from the study that the wild-reared monarchs that they reared indoors did not show immediate migratory behavior. But is it possible that as adults that have already emerged that they could receive enough environmental cues, say over the course of three days, to activate their migratory impulse? Yes, that is still a possibility, and it's a valid question, and it's honestly something that the study can't really provide information on one way or the other. More research would have to be done. Since it is an unknown, though, since we don't have an answer to that question, for those of us who raise wild monarchs, the best practice we can choose to follow would be to rear late-season monarchs outdoors as much as possible. Now, as I've said, I'm not an expert, and so to make sure that I was interpreting the results of the study correctly, I got in touch with one of the authors of it, Dr. Marcus Kronforst. We were able to have a really awesome phone conversation about the group's findings. We then corresponded through emails, and he was able to more formally provide some answers to a few questions. When asked about hobbyists such as ourselves who take in and rear wild monarchs and whether we should continue or not, Dr. Kronforst replied, People who are raising monarchs during the summer and fall should definitely continue to do this if they want, but our research suggests some caveats, some potential pitfalls to avoid. First, captive breeding by commercial companies appears to inhibit migration behavior, so people should focus on raising eggs and larvae that they have collected from nature. Second, people should try to expose the monarchs they are raising to natural outdoors conditions as much as possible while they are raising them. During the late summer and fall, the monarchs are receiving important environmental cues from nature that tell them to develop into migratory butterflies, and our research suggests that it is very easy to disrupt this if you bring the monarchs inside to raise them. When asked if he sees a value to hobbyists doing this in the first place, he said, This is incredibly valuable. I raised monarchs as a kid in school, and it had a huge impact on me. Probably the biggest benefit to raising monarchs is the connection that it creates between people and nature. If you do it the right way, making sure to raise local eggs and doing your best to give them outside conditions, you're raising monarchs that will contribute to the population and migration. And when asked a bit about what outdoor conditions really means, and to go a little bit further into that, what the setup would be like, he advised, This can be accomplished by weighing down one or more pop-up cages on your patio or in your yard. Put a brick inside it to hold it in place. Don't worry too much about rain as long as the rain can't collect in puddles in the cage. A future episode coming out is going to show us those details. And the last thing that cannot be stated enough, all of this is for nothing. 
if the monarchs next year come back to less milkweed than they had before. The true number one way to help out the monarch butterfly is to plant milkweed, restore its lost habitat. I'm Rich Lund. Thank you for hearing me out. Thank you for doing what you can to help out the monarch butterfly. And a special thanks, Dr. Kronforst, for taking the time to help make this episode possible. See you next time, and plant milkweed.